one night I drank so much. I blacked out at the kitchen Island, standing up, sleeping. And anybody who's ever seen anybody overdosing on heroin or alcohol for that matter, it's that, that one breath every 30 to 40 seconds, you're pretty much dying. You're overdosing. Uh, she videos that after she drops our kids off, she comes in the garage with the video rolling and videos that says some things. I woke up in my bed the next morning and that video she had sent to me in a text message. I never would have believed that had I not seen it on video. And then it hit me that this had become normal for my kids. They had come downstairs, ate breakfast with me standing there, passed out next to a a bottle of Jim Beam. Nobody woke me up or said anything and walked past me and just went to school like a normal day. Tears roll down your face Reaching for something Someone to embrace To numb pain Welcome to Sobriety Checkpoint. Are you a parent in recovery wishing for peace and emotional sobriety? Do you find yourself up late at night Googling things like how to overcome negative thinking, or why is my heart racing? Do you wake up with big, ambitious goals only to feel resentful and irritable when you put everyone else's needs first and leave no time for yourself again? Hey, I'm Felicia. I'm a 12-step returned therapist, and I too have battled anxiety and that critical inner voice. All I wanted was peace and just a little bit of time to myself. I tried to strive and achieve to find happiness, but that only left me with more anxiety. I finally realized I needed to discover my true identity to find the peace I was striving to attain. In this podcast, you're going to find solutions to navigating mental health, spirituality, and relationships to experience the peace you've been craving. It's time for that desperately sought-after solo target run. Grab your keys and let's go for a drive. There's no judgment or breathalyzer at this sobriety checkpoint. Blinded by the beauty of it all Recognize I was always destined to fall Into the deepest dark We are stronger than we think we are So fight and show your strength. Welcome back to another episode of Sobriety Checkpoint. Before we get started, I'd like to invite you to become a Sobriety Checkpoint Insider. By becoming an insider, you're going to get weekly updates with the latest podcast episode, emotional sobriety and self-care tips, as well as early bird access to special offers. You can also head over to Facebook and join my community where you're going to find other parents in recovery, seeking solutions to emotional sobriety through exploring mental and emotional health, spirituality, and relationships. Check out the show notes for the Insider and Facebook group links. I hope to see you in there. Lastly, don't forget to subscribe to my show, leave a review, and share it with a friend. Reviews help boost my ratings, which helps other parents in recovery find my show. Thank you so much, and I'm super grateful for your support. All right, now let's get started. Today, I have Ryan Lundy on the show. Ryan is a 16-year infantry veteran of Iraq and Bosnia. He is also a full-time police officer for the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department. I'm excited to have you hear his story today. So here he is. Hi, my name is Ryan Lundy. I'm 43, father of two, married a full-time police officer with the city of Indianapolis. And I've been there for 16 years. I'm a military veteran infantryman that served in Iraq and in Bosnia. I did that for almost 20 years as well before a non-combat injury ended that. My story probably starts out like a lot of people's stories. My father was an alcoholic, left our family when I was five, never paid child support, never helped my mom whatsoever, never came around for uh, birthdays or any of that. 
it was an abusive relationship before that. I witnessed my dad, even at a young age, I still remember him hitting my mom. Always said I was never going to be like that. I had heard from other family members that he was dealing with alcohol issues. And I always told myself, I'm never going to do that. Never going to be that way. Fast forward, graduate high school, join the military. I'm serving all over the world, having a great time. And my 21st, 22nd, and 23rd birthdays are overseas. So I couldn't drink or any of those kind of rite of passage type things that most guys do at that age. Didn't start out as a drinker at all. I was just a fitness guy, just taking care of business, doing everything the right way. And then fast forward to joining the police department. So 2007, I joined the Indianapolis Police Department. Within a couple of years, I lost two beat partners in the line of duty to gunfire that I worked with. The year after that, I lost a classmate also to gunfire. And then one of my recruits, I'm an FT, a field training officer, also known as an FTO. And one of my recruits was also killed in the line of duty. I didn't have her long, a couple weeks to fill in, but I got, when you have somebody riding around in your car, you get to know them pretty well. All of these things combined my time in the military. I did have some PTSD from that, but never really dealt with it professionally. All of the violent incidents and uh, stressors of police work were building up. I I was not dealing with them at all. I started uh, drinking socially. So Colts tailgates, uh, Colts games on TV, country music concerts, every country song revolves around alcohol in some way. We bought a camper and a boat down at Lake Monroe in Bloomington, Indiana, outside of Indiana University. And the weekends turned into drinking and having fun. And then COVID hit and locked everyone indoors. I was never a bar drinker, but my wife and I would drink at home with each other or at friends' homes. So 2020 rolls around and that's pretty much all there was to do, or so we thought anyway at the time. I slipped into a a very predictable pattern of every other day. I would go to the liquor store, buy what I thought was a reasonable amount. I would drink all of that. I never learned moderation at all. Never wanted the party to end. At this point in time, I have a teenager and a 12-year-old at that time. A daughter who's now 18 and a son who's now 15, but they were very impressionable at this age. We'd send them upstairs to their rooms. We would buy them every kind of electronic device to keep them busy. And Lindsay and I would stay downstairs and drink. I would drink to the point of passing out most nights. If I hadn't passed out, admittedly, I would drive drunk to the liquor store. It got to the point where I cared enough that I didn't want the same cashiers at the liquor stores thinking I had a problem. So I would go to different ones. I didn't care about my kids noticing or my friends noticing for some reason I cared about that. So I would wake up in the morning and if I was still, if I still had alcohol in my system, which I had a a breathalyzer, if I still had alcohol in my system, I would call in sick or take a vacation day because I didn't want to screw my department over, but here I am screwing my family over and my, and myself. And then the next day I would feel like complete garbage. The hangovers get worse as you get older. So I wouldn't drink that night. But then the next day after work, it would start all over again. And that went on for over a decade. I have a friend who is in our department wellness unit. Her name is Nicole Jude. She doesn't mind me mentioning her name. And she would see, cause what I was, what I would do, it was, this was such a, a boring life, but I would start political dumpster fire arguments on Facebook and then go to bed and wake up and read the comments. And that's what my hobby was at the time, besides coaching. She would notice what I would do and then what I was doing and then call and ask if everything was okay. And I lied to her for a very long time, still thinking at this time that I could quit if I wanted to. It's no big deal. Like I said a minute ago, I was coaching my daughter's travel softball team. So I thought I was being a good father, better than my father was, at least. I was still in the home, married to my wife and coaching. So 
I thought I was doing my fatherly duties. I was there, but I wasn't really present. By the time I was done with my chores, like coaching or whatever, it was all I could think about was, was alcohol. It went on for a good long time. Um, and then my wife actually quit drinking or quit drinking with me anyway, or so I thought. So she quit altogether, it turns out. She told me she was no longer going to drink and didn't want it in the house. I continued for about 10 more days. And then she told me she was just done, not going to drink anymore. She didn't give me an ultimatum that she was going to leave or divorce me or anything like that. One night I drank so much. I blacked out at the kitchen Island, standing up, sleeping. And anybody who's ever seen anybody overdosing on heroin or alcohol for that matter, it's that, that one breath every 30 to 40 seconds, you're pretty much dying. You're overdosing. Uh, she videos that after she drops our kids off, she comes in the garage with the video rolling and videos that says some things. I woke up in my bed the next morning and that video she had sent to me in a text message. I never would have believed that had I not seen it on video. And then it hit me that this had become normal for my kids. They had come downstairs, ate breakfast with me standing there, passed out next to a a bottle of Jim Beam. Nobody woke me up or said anything and walked past me and just went to school like a normal day. So as I'm laying in bed watching this video, I realize my kids are seeing this. It was like a dagger in the heart. I don't know what it was at this point, but I immediately went to the screen to dial my friend's number. I just got her on the phone. I said, I need help. That phone felt like it weighed about 30 pounds in that moment. I put it out there and my department had me on a flight within a day or two to Florida House, or I think it's called FHE Health, but it used to be called Florida House down in Florida. And it's a program called Shatterproof. It's specifically for first responders and veterans to deal with the kind of traumatic things that we see. So I was down there for 30 some days, which was really helpful. Got me out of my habit, got me out of my routine. While I'm down there, my wife tells me um, the 10 days before I stop drinking the time she stopped drinking. She, she had this experience laying in bed where she saw a light come through the ceiling and she just started confessing all of her sins and apologizing. And I was laying right next to her blacked out, but I didn't hear any of that. Neither one of us were Christians at this point, but she felt that was God or some kind of experience like that. And she was praying for me to stop as well. Since that day, while I was down in therapy, actually, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'm in a couple of men's ministries now. I'm in a life group at church, and it's changed my life completely. Um, Being around people like that, I have a great support group. The department has been completely awesome. They have all kinds of support for me, and I know a lot of people don't have that, but it is out there. Like at the time when, when I called her, I didn't know what that would look like for my career. Uh, I didn't know if I was going to get fired. I didn't even know places like FHE health existed. I just thought I'm going to get fired. But at that time I didn't care anymore. I knew I couldn't keep going. My kids deserved more. Everyone deserved more out of me. I have now been sober for 900 and 38 days today. I haven't had one urge or one craving and it's going great. It's recovered my relationship with my daughter. Most of her life, she knew all of this stuff was going on and I feel terrible about that as a parent. When you think you're doing a great job providing for your family and I was still achieving things at work. I did get in trouble once and that was a wake up call. Social media, I started an argument and got in a little trouble with the department. I got suspended for nine days, which was very expensive. I got removed from the FTO program and I lost master patrolman designation, which takes a very long time to get. Luckily, I work for a department who showed a lot of grace and mercy. Two years later, I was allowed to reapply for those things and gain them back. So That was important for me moving forward because at the time 
I, I just thought everything was over with and I was never going to be able to recover as a police officer or a father, but I knew I couldn't keep going down that same path. If you could tell me a little bit more about how your relationship with your kids has recovered, how are you now as a dad, now that you're sober? Yeah, great question. So my kids, and I'm sure all kids are this way, they are actually paying way closer attention to things than you think they are. They're taking everything in. They knew exactly what we were doing. They knew it was a problem. They had talked about it with their grandmother. We, we weren't close at all, my, my son and I and my daughter and I. My son was scared to approach any part of it. Um, he just went along with it. My daughter, she's a little more brave and uh, she would say things and try to get us on track there, but we weren't having any of it or we were in the throes of an addiction. My, my wife included, she's now been sober 10 days longer than me. So it helps when both people in the house are doing the same thing. I'm sure most therapy programs cover these kind of things, but you're down there getting the help that you need when your family's still at home, you leave them where they were. Like they're not getting ex extra help. They're not being told like your dad's going to come home after this training and be, be this type of person now. So they don't know what to expect when you come home. Callie was really on guard. She didn't believe any of this was going to stick. There were times where I would pick her up from practice or school and she would get in my car, shut the door and say, I smell alcohol. And that would just really make me mad. And I, at first I would, I'd get really angry and be like, no, you don't. I yell at her. Like it's not, you don't smell it in here. And I don't know if she was doing that to probe or if she really did smell that, but it would make me mad because to me, I was working really hard to show them that I've changed. I know you can tell them whatever you want, but you have to show them. I noticed with my kids, it didn't matter if I was telling them me and your mom, or we haven't drank in two or three months. It seemed like they didn't really care. They needed proof. So we started doing more things together. I've talked about it now with both of them, how it was an addiction and it can get a hold of anybody. It's really important for me to try to have a closer relationship with especially her because you know, she just turned 18, graduated high school. And I know my time with her is, oh, that's kind of tears me up, is uh, very limited. I wasted a lot of time being selfish with her, even though, you know, I was coaching her like every day we had hitting lessons and pitching lessons and then practice three times a week and then weekends doing travel ball stuff. But I was more of a coach to her than a dad doing that kind of stuff. We didn't have the same kind of loving relationship that I see my other friends having. My daughter and I weren't that close. And I know my, I know she resented what was going on in the house. It's been very important for me to try to show her along with tell her. I, it's almost like I, I have to rush things with her because she's going to be leaving soon for the Air Force. I feel like I have a little bit more time with my son only being 15, but it's a process. We were told down there, don't force the conversations. They will come naturally. And that, that has been the case with her. She's always been a standoff person, especially with me. I've never been a super emotional, sensitive kind of dad that talks about her boyfriends and stuff like that. I've, I've just never been that kind of dad. I think she needed that from me and didn't get it. I still have a lot of making up to do, but I'm committed to showing her how much we've changed. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, would you take 30 seconds and share it with another parent in recovery who may be looking for solutions to mental health and sobriety? Also, please leave a quick review on Apple Podcasts so other parents just like you can find the show. I'm super excited to know this podcast is helping you. Tune in to new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. I'll see you back here on your next Target Run. Until next time. We are stronger than we think we are. 
So fight and show your strength. Learn grace from our God. Learn grace from our God. Learn grace from our God. Oh, learn grace from our God.